Hello everyone, thank you all for joining us. Today's webinar topic is Toward a 7P Framework for International Marketing. The speaker person for today's section is Dr. Justin Paul. He currently serves as an Editor-in-Chief of International Journal of Consumer Studies. He's a former faculty member with the University of Washington and he's a full professor of PhD and MBA programs in the University of Puerto Rico, USA. Dr. Paul is known as an author and co-author of books such as Business Environment, International Marketing, Service Marketing, Export Info Management, and Management of Banking and Financial Services. Dr. Paul has served as a lead guest editor with the International Business Review, Journal of Business Research, Journal of Retailing and Consumer Services, Asia Pacific Business Review and the European Business Review. He serves as an associate editor with the European Management Journal and Journal of Strategic Marketing. Dr. Paul introduced Mastich model and measure for brand management, TPP model for internationalization, scope framework for small firms, and 7P framework for international marketing that we will be discussing today. Thank you, Eurasia Foundation and Middlesex University of England for inviting and supporting this video lecture series. May I invite Dr. Justin Paul to deliver today's presentation. Okay, so I'm here today to deliver lecture on 7P framework for performance and international marketing. Let me try to give you some ideas about uh, survival and success of an organization or survival and success of a company. Globalization has gathered momentum during the last 20 years. Everybody knows that globalization uh, has created opportunities and challenges in different ways, different permutations and combinations, and globalization has been considered as an irreversible process. Corona crisis and COVID-19 has uh, created some kind of tension and stress on the process of globalization. On the other hand, multinational companies have been growing by leaps and bounds during last 10 or 20 years. Small and medium scale enterprises were trying to uh, survive and succeed the way they can uh, or they could possibly try to survive and succeed. Competition has intensified and competition is going to be much more in the post COVID-19 uh, time period. And given this background, given this context, I've been doing a lot of research on how to develop useful models from the point of view of practitioners as well as academicians. My goal last 10 years has been trying to bridge the gap between academia and the real life company life or the real life industry. I developed a mass teach model for brand management initially, that was my first model. Then I developed CPP model. Then along with uh, Dr. Eric Maas from University of North Texas, I developed this 7P framework for international marketing. And this was published last year. And these 7P constructs are completely different from the traditional 4P or 7P, which are taught in the classroom for last 20 years or 25 years. So those P's are completely different and these P's are completely different. Those P's are more useful for marketing in a state or marketing in a district or marketing in a city. These P's that I'm going to discuss today will be useful for you, not only for marketing in your country, but also to take your business into or, or to transcend the horizons uh, in, in, in the world of business in different foreign markets as well. So what motivated me to think about this model or this framework? Or why do we need this framework? Let me explain the reason. Let me explain the rationale. 
I lived in Japan for three and a half years. I worked in Japan. I was in Japan working for three and a half years. And I learned what I learned. The main lesson I learned from Japan is secret of success, success secret of Japan. Or secrets of, secrets of success of Japanese companies. In case if you have one, if you were, you know, if you know Sachin Tendulkar, the cricket star, he comes in television commercials and he comes, boost is secret of my energy, boost is secret of my success. So my question to you is, do you think that a company can achieve success with Boost or Horlicks or Bonvita? If your answer is no, then let's look at how did Japanese companies achieve success? How did Korean companies achieve success? Everything in Japan was destroyed in 1940s during the Second World War. And 1950s and 1960s and 1970s, Japanese and Japanese companies worked very hard. And they worked with the slogan, let's work hard and sell to the strangers. Sell to the strangers simply meant, let's produce and export. Let's encourage our companies to internationalize their operations and businesses. Let's try to capitalize the capabilities created by our companies from foreign markets. So in simple words, I would say, Japanese companies succeeded focusing on international business. They focused on different foreign market. They prepared business plan and marketing plan, looking at different foreign market. They estimated market potential. They prepared business strategy. And they specifically tailor-made marketing strategies, organic and inorganic marketing strategies. And they succeeded. Followed by success of Japan, Korean companies also followed the suit like a bandwagon effect focusing on international business. Korea was a poor country. Korea was a developing country in 1960s and 1970s. By 1990s, in about 20 years time, Korea emerged as an advanced country with the success of Korean, Korean companies or Korean multinational enterprises succeeded and in and, and the international business. Korean companies like Samsung, LG, and you know, they all succeeded in international business, which helped them. And now look at China. Last 25 years, China did the same thing. China tried to imitate Japan and Korea, and China has been very successful in international business during last 20 years or 25 years. China made almost everything for the rest of the world. China turned out to be the factory for the world. And China, you know, so, the, the, the globalization and China, China, the name of China turned out to be like synonym. So Chinese companies have shown that uh, they can do wonderful uh, you know, things and they can achieve success with all this uh, internationalization. So internationalization of a company is key and a company has to grow. Company has to build their brand in the foreign market. Company has to be a global brand to survive in the era of globalization. So, this is the context and this is the rationale for developing this framework. Now, I would go on to explaining what this framework is, how you will be in a position to use this framework for different companies, wherever you are going to work or wherever you are working or whatever the business that you do or whatever business you will be doing in future. Okay. The basic notion is, I put it here in inverted comma. A, a company, a firm increases its likelihood of survival when it goes international. Sometimes companies will face loss in their own country. 
So they need to diversify their businesses. This is important. I'll tell you a couple of examples. Japanese company Suzuki, you know about Suzuki, Suzuki Motor Corporation. Suzuki is not successful in Japan. But Suzuki internationalized its operation to countries like India and Africa. Suzuki is very successful in India. For example, Maridi Suzuki is manufactured as a joint venture between Maridi of India and Suzuki of Japan. And they made tremendous amount of profit from Indian market. And I can tell you a lot of other examples as well. American company, General Motors, GM. GM is a car company from America. General Motors went bankrupt in America, GM's home country, in the year 2008-2009. Look at, GM was a very famous multinational company, still a company, still a multinational company. But GM announced bankruptcy, GM announced loss in GM's own country, America. On the other hand, GM made huge profits from GM China business. GM established joint venture for car making in China. GM and Shanghai Automotive Industry Corporation, they were doing business together in China. And GM China business turned out to be a jewel in GM crowd. In other words, I can say, while GM went bankrupt in US, in America, in GM's own country, GM is an American company. GM made profit from China, but at the same time, GM announced bankruptcy in, in GM's own country, US. So this gives us insight. So this motivates us to do businesses internationally or to think about going to different foreign market to leverage the opportunities arising out of different foreign markets. It's important and critical to do this way. Okay. So I give you this article title in case if you want to read this article. So its article is titled as to add a 7P framework for international marketing. It's available in Journal of Strategic Marketing, which was published last year. Globalization, my next point. Globalization has made companies search for foreign market opportunities necessary in order to survive. If there is globalization of production and consumption, companies will have to move with the flow. If American companies and Japanese companies are trying to internationalize their operation to catch fish in the era of globalization, Indian and Chinese companies also need to do the same thing. So you have to explore foreign market opportunities as a company. Infosys has done it, Wipro has done it. Microsoft has done it. Amazon has done it. Google has done it, Apple has done it, Uber has internationalized operations from America to different countries, including India. So look at any of the big companies, all these big companies, they have become big, they have created global brands because their business plan included a main component of globalizing their operations, focusing on internationalization into different foreign markets, to search for more and more opportunities. It is crucial and it is critical in the era of globalization. As you know, there has been rapid increase in international transactions taking place in the recent years. Last 25 years, there has been rapid increase. There has been increase in volume of international transactions. Last five months or six months, there is sluggishness, globalization, 
uh, has turned out to be deglobalization for last six months because of Corona COVID-19 crisis, which is almost like World War III. So otherwise, before that, 25 years were the time period for globalization. Companies have had to rethink their global strategies these days. With the Corona COVID crisis, companies will have to rethink their strategies, at least for next two years. Next two years is going to be time period for deglobalization. I would expect three years will be deglobalization time. Yeah, in our model that we developed, in our 7P model, 7P framework, we argue that a company from an emerging economy should carry out an analysis based on these P constructs from our framework before going global so that they can perform better after internationalization. This 7P framework that I'm presenting today is mainly for companies from developing countries, like companies from developing countries like India or China. And we call for companies to use this 7P framework, these 7P constructs, before going global, before internationalizing their operations, because if they use this 7P framework, they can perform better after internationalization. The goal, objective here, or the main purpose of introducing this 7P framework is motivate, is to motivate companies to perform better. Okay. Yeah, what are these 7P constructs in this framework? Here, the dependent variable, or here, the goal, the outcome, the goal is considered, you know, here you can see performance. What is, the, what is the goal? The performance. Performance is the ultimate goal. And I love to say that performance in foreign markets. When we talk about 70 Pagi details. Hmm? Uh, up country. Yeah. Uh -huh. so performance is our goal and performance in foreign markets. Performance can be measured in terms of total sales revenue. And in order to achieve performance, we call for in this framework, when we introduce this framework, myself and Dr. Rick Maas, we discussed and deliberated and debated on how to how to present this or how to be how to how to uh, articulate the ideas and put it together in a useful and effective way so here the equation is performance is a function of potential path process space pattern and problems so performance is equal to other piece performance is the last piece seventh p Potential is the first P, which means companies will have to estimate the market potential of different markets before they enter into those markets, before they decide and choose to enter into those markets. Companies will have to look at and analyze the path, the growth path of these companies on their way to succeed. For example, they have to, they have to look at sources of funds they have to look at what strategies they should follow for example entry strategies should these companies follow strategic alliances or should these companies follow equity joint venture should these companies follow acquisition strategy or should they follow their own branch expansion instead of acquisition that is branch expansion opening their own branches is an example for organic growth strategy so such kind of path, what kind of path with reference to strategy they should follow. So including how do they generate sources of funds. All these are part of path and processes. Processes that they should follow while internationalizing or while trying to expand their business, while trying to go global, while trying to grow global. 
going global and growing global is considered as a most important function for a company in the era of globalization to survive and succeed and to create a global brand. So different, they, they can follow, these companies can follow different processes to undertake these global operations. They can focus on digital marketing, they can focus on traditional marketing, they can focus on a lot of partnership with uh, successful companies for distribution, dealership and so on. So whatever the processes that they have to undertake, different processes, they have to, they have to discuss and deliberate and include this as part of business plan. So this 7P framework, what we are presenting, what I am discussing today, should be or can be used as part of your business plan, as part of your marketing plan. For example, you can prepare an international business plan using this 7P framework. You know, you can prepare an international business plan or international marketing plan using the 7P framework in your MBA classroom or your bachelor degree classroom uh, for different companies. And these PE constructs will be very useful to prepare this international business plan because companies need to prepare this kind of business plan before they go abroad, before they go global. They need to build, this is like a, you know, when you build, a, when, when you want to construct a building, you need to have a plan. So you need to have a business plan before you venture into foreign market. And this will help you to prepare that business plan. That is the main goal of this, this uh, 7P framework. This will work as theoretical lens in your research studies as well. And next P, the fourth P is pace. You can see the arrow mark. All these six P's lead to performance. Or in other words, I can say, these six P's are determinants of performance. Pace is nothing but the speed. Speed of entry, change of entry more strategy, change of different strategy in foreign markets or before entering to foreign market. Or uh, should they stick to only one strategy or should they have a multiple strategy? All this and what pace, what speed? You know, some companies expand their business at the speed of light. How many seconds it takes to turn off a light, to turn off a light? It takes three seconds. Some companies expand like that. Ran back, see, once upon a time, expanded into foreign market at the speed of light with the daredevil sense of enterprise. So some companies expanded that way in the, in the past. So you have, to, you have to also look at, or you have to also plan, you have to also estimate, or you have to also decide the pace of your expansion very well in advance. If you think you don't need planning to decide your pace, you might fail. You need, you need to focus on certain things and you need to build upon certain things and you need to decide the pace of your operations in advance as part of your business plan. And pattern, pattern is the next P, fifth P. Pattern includes product portfolio, product diversification, product differentiation and so on. For example, if you try to sell, if you try to focus only on one market or two markets, you have more risk. But if you have diversified market destinations, your risk is minimum. So in business, your goal is to minimize your risk. In order to minimize your risk, it is better and it's always better to have a diversified pattern into several foreign market destinations so that you know if you don't get business from this market you get business from some other markets market a may be having fever you get market b you can catch fish from market b pattern also includes product diversification product portfolio product differentiation and so on for example, Apple, Apple iPhone, 
is available in different models. They would say iPhone 6s, iPhone 7, iPhone SC, iPhone XC, iPhone XL, all these kind of things. This is a product differentiation because they can attract different type of customers. They can attract budget customers. They can attract luxury customers. They can attract all type of customers. Louis Vuitton, Louis Vuitton or Louis Vuitton bags are available in at least 10 different names, 10 different fashion. So this is also because they would like to attract different types of customers. So this is part of patent strategy and problems. So patent also should be part of your business plan. Ultimately, all these are part of your business plan. That's what we would like to visualize. Problems. You have to expect, you have to anticipate problems in business. Problems are to be anticipated as part and parcel of your business. Problems are part of your life as well, or my life, or your life, any, any individual's life. Everybody faces some kind of problems and challenges in daily life. Businesses also face challenges. Some are anticipated, expected, some are unexpected problems. So when you prepare business plan, you have to account, you have to include problems and you have to anticipate, you have to discuss and deliberate and debate what are the likely problems this company or my company will face in, in future. First two years or first year, this is a likely problem. First two years, this is a likely problem. First five years, these are the likely problem. And you know, your business plan should consist of the strategies to overcome these problems as well. And if you have a proper scientific structured business plan based on this six P framework, first six P's, that will help you to achieve greater performance, better performance, optimum performance, and you can reduce your cost and you can increase your profit and result is your superior performance compared to your competitors. This is the seven P framework and I have, I have propositions and I have more details about uh, different P's in my next set of slides. For example, I explain here potential. What is potential? Potential is my first P in, in my previous slide. Potential is nothing but opportunities and activities in the host market that create a favorable or unfavorable position for incoming firms. Yeah, so you, you have to look at, you can analyze and estimate the opportunities and activities in a foreign market or in a host market. If you want to enter into that market and you have to do this estimation, it's important. I do have some more set of slides. So before I go on to my remaining slides, I would like to take a break and give you an opportunity for five minutes to ask a couple of questions so that I can answer those questions and I can uh, come back to these slides after that. So anybody who has a question, you can uh, just raise your hand and uh, we can allow you for a question. We'll unmute you. Okay, uh, this is, uh, I'll just allow you. Okay. Hello, can you hear me, sir? Yeah. Hello, uh, sir. Vimal Chandra, uh, you can speak now. You are unmuted. Oh, okay, okay. So, right now we have Shabji who's. Who... Thanks, sir. Uh, sir, may I, uh, Justin, sir, uh, may I ask a question? Yes. Sir, I basically want to know that GM is a very big company from USA. What was the probable reason for failure in India? Why they have uh, they taken back their business? Was there some problem with their international marketing policies or programs? What was the uh, reason behind it? Because they are doing very well in other countries, but uh, they could not survive in India being a big, very big company. Yeah, so GM... GM survived very well in China, so 
uh, in the market may be different or unique, and in the maybe competition and GM's uh, strategic marketing might not. Have, I, I don't have a statistics on uh, looking at you to comment uh, with authenticity on your question because uh, okay. I, unless and until I have statistics, it would not make sense. Okay. So it would not make prudent to comment specifically, but. Uh, uh, I think GM was successful in the beginning in India. I don't know currently yeah. what is GM's market share because, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, so maybe they, they I have, to, I, you know, so this is a very specific question about GM company, but I know more about GM in China and GM in America. Okay. okay. In America, GM went bankrupt because uh, people, people in America, car market in America is a saturated market. Not only that, Japanese companies achieved tremendous market share in, in America. Toyota is the leading car company in America. So Toyota and Honda captured significant market share in America and GM lost uh, its uh, share to Japanese companies even in GM's own country in America. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks a lot, sir, for your... Uh information your answer okay we have uh, mr shabd who would want to ask a question uh, okay sir uh, your first p potential is giving about market analysis and your last p sorry sixth p problem is giving about challenges so is it the almost same as sort analysis when you're connecting these two no sort analysis is very broad this is very specific that's the difference sort analysis uh, includes uh, economy politics yes. and everything so this is this this is very specific and precise. This is like a capsule. Okay. Short analysis okay. is uh, you know it's a very it's, it's a complete it's it's very very broad. Oh. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? If anybody has, you can just uh, raise your hand in the in the message box. We can just allow you for for uh, for unmuting. So one question that has just come is that uh, which amongst the seven P's you consider to be the most important without which you feel inadequacies may be seen? Yeah, I mean, the, the, what is more important of which P construct is more important is that I, I, would, I would say that I would, I would uh, try to, uh, you know, I would try to say that uh, Potential and problems are more important. I would not say that potential is more important than problems. You have to potential, the first piece potential, and last piece problems. So those two are to be seen with due seriousness while you prepare your business plan. So because you know you have to understand the potential of different market, different countries, or different. Uh, it, it is actually useful for marketing within a country also because you have to estimate uh, market potential in different states if you're trying to plan marketing in different countries, sorry, in, in, in a country. But if you're, uh, if you're trying to do international marketing, you have to estimate or you have to analyze the market potential of different countries. There is, a, there is statistics available. You know, if you look at uh, msu.globaledge website, globaledge.msu website, there is data on uh, market potential and market size of different countries. So market potential is estimated using population, electricity consumption, and uh, income of people in different countries. Market size is estimated just based on population. So market potential can be estimated and, it, and, and market potential of different countries. Overall market potential is available online on uh, Michigan State University website, globaledge.msu website. So companies can use that or even, even in classroom, students can use that data to estimate market potential if they want to prepare a specific business plan. So, and and uh, problems, my last P that I was talking about is also important because uh, as I said earlier, you have to anticipate, you have to expect problems and what kind of problems uh, you know, will be there in your business. You need to anticipate and you need to discuss that beforehand. If you discuss that beforehand, you can overcome, you can also prepare plan to overcome those problems. If you don't understand those beforehand, you know, so then, then uh, suddenly you face problems, you will have challenges. You know, we all face this COVID-19 as unanticipated, unexpected problem. So, uh, 
then it, it turned out to be a stressful activity. It turned out to be completely problematic. So you have, you have to plan this. I mean, expected and unexpected problems should be accounted as part of business plan. So traditional business plan that you have taught or that you have studied or that is there in the textbook doesn't have this problem components. So I incorporate problem components. Yeah. So if you have any other question, I can answer. Otherwise, I can go ahead with my next uh, slide. There, there is one person who has raised his hand. Mr. Shijit, uh, we will just unmute you. Okay. Uh, sir. Yeah. So my question is that uh, related to promotion. Okay. So the topic is relevant in this pandemic situation. So my question is that in this seven piece of uh, international marketing, is there any space for promotion in your uh, uh, concept? Yeah. So we, we, do, we, we don't include promotion as part of this seven P framework. So, but uh, promotion, you can link with, uh, uh, you know, like uh, the, the, uh, we, we have another P which is related to promotion, but we don't, we don't directly talk about promotion. Okay. Thank you. So there's just one question that we have, uh, one more question we have in the chat box. Uh, it says that whether this 7P framework is being applied to any industry as of now, or is it only an, a theoretical framework? No, yeah, it has been applied. People are applying in different classrooms these days. I know that, uh, in uh, classrooms in some of the American universities like Florida and New York and all, they are applying professors have used this already in uh, different classrooms and students are preparing business plan. And it's a relatively new framework. It was published only a year and a half ago. So it takes time for any model or any theory or any framework to get popular. It takes average five years time to become, I mean, to, to be uh, worldwide popular uh, and acceptability comes up to that because people are slow and professors are also slow sometimes because they want to teach the same thing that they studied for uh, 10 years so that they taught for 10 years. So there is reluctance uh, uh, for including new things, uh, you know, because it, it, it requires homework and it requires effort. So people are easygoing. So all these are also constraints in our life. Yeah. Any other question? Uh, I think we can proceed, sir. Okay. Okay, I talked about uh, potential. Yeah, so you have to identify potential in different market. Like uh, let's say you represent an Indian company. You want to undertake internationalization. You will, you will estimate or you will understand, analyze the potential of Sri Lanka, England, Germany, USA, Japan, and so on. USA is a big market. USA has 300 million people. Average income is $45,000, $46,000. So you have to look at the Sri Lanka, how many people? You know, you have to look at that way. And how much is the average income? And likewise, you have to look at Germany, 80 million people, average income, almost $50,000. So more than $50,000. So likewise, uh, you have to estimate uh, market potential and then you have to also take into account political and economic uh, dimensions in those specific markets. You can also compare with less developed countries. Sometimes competition in those highly sought after markets are very high competition. So if you go to less developed countries, sometimes you don't have much competition. That is why all the Chinese companies have focused on less developed countries and developing countries. Chinese companies have captured the market in developing countries and less developed countries in a big way. So I present some proposition as part of this framework and you will see this proposition in the article also. Companies from emerging countries could find high probability of success in other developing as well as developed countries. This is a proposition one. And this is a proven proposition because if you look at Chinese companies, China is an emerging country. And if you go to Africa, or if you go to Eastern Europe, or if you go to South America, if you go to other developing countries, 
in Asia, you will find that Chinese jobs, Chinese business, Chinese towns are everywhere. I had an opportunity to go to Dominican Republic. It's a country very close to America, and, but it is a less developed country. There is a very big Chinese town in Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic is very, very far from China, but China has succeeded even in Dominican Republic. I went to Africa once. I was traveling to Africa as a trainer for African diplomats, like IAS officers in Africa. I was a trainer. And this program was held in Rwanda, Africa. And my flight was full of Chinese looking people. I was sitting in the airplane and I, I was surprised why all the people, all the fellow passengers are Chinese looking. What is the reason I was thinking? It's simply because all the Chinese companies are sending Chinese people to undertake business activities in African countries. China has focused on African countries for last 10 or 20 years. And even African countries are part of the Belt Road Initiative. So proposition, a general proposition based on this business scenario, this business activities that I have learned based on my own real life observation as well as based on the experience of several other companies. Proposition one, companies from emerging countries could find high probability of success in other developing as well as less developed countries. And it is easier to succeed in those type of countries because competition is not much in those countries. The next P, P2, second P, path. Path refers to strategy, fund sources, type of companies, and so on. So here, we have identified a very, very interesting point. Firms from developing countries, companies from developing countries, traditionally begin internationalization using exporting as their first mode of entry, then set up other subsidiaries, foreign subsidiaries, any other combination, franchising or anything comes later. But exporting is their first mode of entry. Companies from developing countries find it easier to undertaking export activities compared to any other entry mode. FDI is very difficult. So exporting is very easy. Proposition two. Relate, this is relating to path. Firms from emerging countries need to formulate specific strategies to expand into developing developed countries. Here the point is developed countries. If you represent a company from a developing country, you need specific concrete strategy, precise formula, to expand into developed countries. I will tell you an example. I went to Australia when I was 22. I was born and raised in Kerala state of India. You know, when you, when you, are, when you are in India or when you, when you are born and raised in India, you don't have five or $10 to pay for a coffee in a foreign airport like Australian airport. I went to Sydney when I was 22. I landed at Sydney airport. I looked at the coffee shops. All the coffee shops at Sydney airport was charging $10 for a coffee. I was unable to pay $10 for a coffee when I went to Australia first time. I did not have $10 to pay for a coffee. And almost all companies from developing countries face this problem. When they send their managers to foreign locations, especially in developed countries, expenses are much more. Expenses are seven times, 10 times. And these companies, they don't have enough resources to pay for those expenses. So it's a challenge. 
This is proposition two. This is also explained in the article. Uh, to add a 7P framework for international marketing article. Process. This is third P. Yeah, there are some research studies. Those who have shown that Latin American companies are often slow to internationalize. Latin America is a developing country region. It's a region of many developing countries. Or in other words, you can say most of the Latin American countries are emerging countries. And some researchers have found that Latin American companies are often slow, slow to internationalize. There are several reasons for that. And even when you compare American companies or European companies or Japanese companies, the pace of internationalization is relatively high compared to the pace of internationalization of companies from developing countries like India or Latin America. Latin American companies, for example, focus on being competitive on current markets. And Latin American companies gradually expand abroad, mainly to USA. USA is a dream market for Latin American companies. For example, Mexican companies, their dream is to expand into USA and capture market share from USA. And they also talk about catch-up strategy, catch-up strategy for companies from emerging markets to internationalize into developed markets. Firms from developing countries in general do not have the propensity to be born global as they are primarily regional. Yeah, so this is proposition three. So I have seven P constructs. I have different propositions associated with different P constructs as well. There is a concept called born global companies. Born global simply means companies are created or companies are established to do global business. Most of the American companies or several of American companies are created, are born global. For example, Apple is a born global company. Uber is a born global company. Microsoft is a born global company. They are created to do global business. Google is a born global company. However, they are all American companies. However, companies from developing countries do not have the propensity to be born global. They are primarily regional or they are primarily local. And there are reasons for why these companies from developing countries do not have the propensity to be born global. I will explain that. Space, the next P is pace. Speed of internationalization. Pace is nothing but speed of internationalization. And there are certain factors that determine the pace. Technology, competition, Technology, if, you are, if your company is using advanced technology, if they are good in digital marketing, that helps internationalization, that helps competition. And uh, yeah, I would also like to talk a little bit about CPP model. This is another model similar to 7P model. CPP model was developed uh, three years ago. CPP model stands for conservative, predictable, and pacemaker companies and pacemaker markets. CPP model is also for internationalization of companies. This was published as an article in Canadian Journal of Administrative Sciences. C stands for conservative companies. We call companies those who 
do business only in local market. Companies that generate their revenue only from one country, we call them as conservative companies. And second type of companies, predictable type of companies. These companies, they generate substantial amount of revenue from regional markets. For example, a French company is generating substantial revenue from other European countries. That means we call them as predictable companies or predictable market, predictable firms. Because European market is operating like a single country, single predictable market. European Union is a predictable market. Likewise, ASEAN is a predictable market. NAFTA is a predictable market. So companies generating substantial amount of revenue from a legally integrated market. We call them as predictable. Pacemaker market or pacemaker company. Companies generating substantial percentage of revenue from global market. We call them as pacemaker companies and pacemaker markets. So this is another model, which is also related to this, but I just wanted to throw some light on the CPP model. So we also call for companies to undertake global operations and go and grow like uh, pacemaker companies, rather than working as conservative companies. Because if you operate only in local market, you simply uh, ignore the opportunities arising out of globalization. Proposing proposition four. Firms from developing countries use exporting as an entry mode to begin the process of internationalization and use more than one entry mode or switch entry modes over the years. This is another point, another proposition. Patent. Patent is next P. Patent relate to what and where. What product or service is sold, where it is sold. Are they sold in multiple markets rather than single markets? And also product diversification, product portfolio. Food, beverages, raw materials, and agriculture. This is important. And services. I mean, you know, for example, if you have a company specializing in food marketing or food manufacturing, you can also diversify into beverages. So this is the idea. For example, if you are selling gold, you can also sell diamond. That's the idea. Yeah, so this is a map of Latin America. Proposition five. Companies from developing countries tend to succeed primarily in exporting agricultural items rather than industrial products. Yeah, agricultural items. Companies from developing countries are focused primarily on agricultural items. This is the challenge because companies from developing countries or developing countries are not self-sufficient in industrial products. They are not very strong in manufacturing. China is an exception. China is very strong in manufacturing. China is also strong in agriculture. I do have this speech and several other speeches and my case studies and my uh, different lectures on YouTube. So you can subscribe to youtube.com slash DR for my lecture videos, including this lecture is recorded and given on YouTube as a capsule video in case if you want to watch this again later. So simply remember youtube.com slash drjustinpaul to subscribe this. Problems. Now I define these problems with reference to specific issues. When we talk about problems of internationalization, when you want to do international business, especially you are a company from an emerging country, you will face three types of problems. Problem one, cognitive bias. Problem two, liability of foreignness. Problem three, resource limitations. 
problem one cognitive bias most companies face this cognitive bias i tell you an example rand back sees chief executive officer malvinder singh was invited to meet with a business partner in switzerland and when malvinder singh from rand back c arrived in switzerland office of his switzerland business partner a swiss company the ceo of swiss company asked malvinder singh to wait for two more hours to meet with him secretary of ceo told malvinder singh you have to wait for two more hours and you are from india you can wait no problem my ceo is very busy this is part of cognitive bias this is a perception cognitive bias refers to perception of product quality based on producing a company's country of origin yeah sometimes people in developed countries they have a perception when i was teaching at uh, university of washington one of my student a girl she told me india has snakes india is full of snakes that is her perception about india it's a country with lot of snakes you know i don't know whether india has lot of snakes but this is a perception so cognitive bias arises out of perception of different countries liability of foreigners cause of lack of knowledge and experience in host country yeah so lack of knowledge liability of foreigners when you want to go to foreign country first time you will face liability of foreigners this is because many times you have lack of knowledge you don't understand what they talk about suppose an indian coming to america american stock in terms of pounds and miles american stock in terms of gallon for gasoline they don't talk in terms of liter and they pronounce often as often there are differences globalization is spelt with z z is pronounced as z in america in india it is pronounced as z the alphabet but it is z in america the last letter of a to z or a to z so there are those kind of differences sometimes you don't understand those kind of connotation you don't understand proverbs okay so many many Uh, acronyms many jargons many buzzwords you don't understand all those so this kind of cost of lack of knowledge is also to be to be to be to be foreseen and to be overcome sometimes if you go to a lang if you go to a country where language is completely different it can be also challenge resource limitations this is another problem resources i mean companies from developing countries they have this problem they don't have enough resources and this can be problems arising out of resources with reference to capital managerial talent technology brand equity etc these all problems yeah so this can be explained in detail but i don't have time to explain everything now but uh, you can read the article i can share the article with you if you like to read and you can send me an email or contact me or contact palvi and uh, we can discuss this uh, also later and i have to give you some time to uh, time to answer your questions so liability of foreigners i already explained this when you don't know about the procedures culture and language or jargons used in foreign countries you face liability of foreigners resource limitation it's nothing but resource constraints money you don't have enough money i told you an example when you go to a developed country you need 10 dollar to buy a coffee from airport so people from developing countries they don't have 10 dollar to buy a coffee from a airport or even in a big city in a developed country 
ten dollar is equal to seven hundred and fifty Indian rupees for a coffee. How can you pay that? Proposition six: Firms from developing countries, in particular small and medium sales enterprises, often face problems such as cognitive bias, liability of foreignness, and financial constraints while trying to internationalize their business. So I have these propositions and I have these P constructs. So I would like to summarize what determines performance. Performance is a function of other six P's. Performance is equal to, fun performance is a function of potential path, process, space, pattern, and problems. Proposition seven, the last proposition, internationalization positively affect the performance of companies from developing countries. Yes, internationalization undoubtedly positively contribute towards the performance of companies from developing countries because if a company sells their product in, a, in their own country, if it is a developing country, they can only make $5. The same product they can sell in a developed country for $25. So they are the beneficiaries. So they have to internationalize, they have to sell in developed countries. It's important and it is critical and it is crucial for their success. I do have updates. I update the very important business updates, very important professional updates and users, some videos, some useful stuff on my Twitter account. I've been uh, you know, using only for last two months, but I've become active on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter also with twitter.com slash DR Justin Paul. My YouTube and Twitter and Skype, everything is DR Justin Paul. Website, everything is DR Justin Paul. So, uh, yeah. So now I would prefer to give you time to ask you a question. So, the, yeah. So I, I summarize my contact details here, YouTube, Twitter, email and website. So you can, you can take this and uh, uh, stay in touch. And, and uh, now it is also time for you to ask your questions. So anybody who has any question, you can once again raise your hands and uh, we can again invite you and we'll unmute you. I think there's one question somebody wanted to ask, probably it is Mr. Shijit. He, has, he had raised in hand. Okay, we will just allow you. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, my question is that whether we can apply this concept in our domestic market also? Like with some yes. of your po uh, po uh, some of your points which you mentioned in that. So that uh, that also can apply in marketing domestic uh, business. These constructs can be applied in domestic market also. These propositions are useful for foreign markets, but these constructs, these seven P constructs, are useful for domestic marketing also. Okay. Sir. Okay. So there is a question that's been put up in the chat box that uh, can this seven P framework be applied for FDI as well? Yes, it is also useful and applicable in the case of FDI also. It can be it can be used in FDI related research also. All right. Uh, another person, Navdeep Kaur, would like to ask a question, sir. I'm just unmuting her. Navdeep, can you unmute? Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. I am uh, Dr. Navdeep from Department of Law, Jammu University. Though I'm not from uh, the stream, but uh, having an interest in company law and having read one book, uh, which is uh, titled Bottle of Lies by Catherine, that's pertaining to Ranbaxy. You discussed about the cognitive bias that uh, you're the CEO of Ranbaxy was not allowed for uh, a period of, uh, you know, uh, two hours and he was made to wait there. What do you have to say regarding uh, these uh, generic companies where, you know, uh, 
these people they also come to the the people from their countries they visit uh, the companies in order to see how the manufacturing is going on so this this and what they found was uh, that uh, renvaxi was not working as per the norms based upon which this uh, book was written so what do you have to say regarding is there any kind of cognitive bias in any such case in in, in such kind of cases Cognitive bias is a function of uh, perception of other people. I mean, you know, especially people in developed countries, they have cognitive bias towards uh, people or companies from developing countries in general, but that is not the case with uh, everyone in developed countries. So it's only some people in developed countries that they have that perception. So perception uh, is created, or perception is developed as far as one shop. over the years because when they watch some videos you know it's about let's say they watch uh, videos of uh, uh, 100000 people living in one kilometer area in country like india or city like calcutta so people in developed countries they get a feeling that this is india you know so there are a lot of or beggars in delhi new delhi streets so all these create negative perception so this is a challenge so i don't know about the specific situation that you are talking about but ranbaxi is a so it's a very good book bottle of flies it's all about ranbaxi that they were given a chance to sell their uh, generic uh, drugs in the american market and later on it was found uh, as has been projected in that book i do not know uh, what is the truth actually so uh, what was projected in uh, what has been written in that book that is uh, they misused that opportunity and they were selling the products which were not up to mark and they were not uh, having any kind of they were not showing any kind of efficacy as such so i think on that point uh, if we if we uh, think on those lines i don't find that kind of uh, you know bias should occur for a company having a reputation surely the generic companies Uh, you cannot compare them with the internationally renowned companies yeah but like uh, ranbaxi faced some challenges in america at the same time ranbaxi has also succeeded in selling generic drugs in american pharmaceutical for example walgreens walgreens is one of the ma- famous pharmacy in america and walgreens sells uh, ranbaxi's generic drug okay thank you so much okay Uh, so there is one question that what recommendation would you like to give to newer players entering the global arena particularly in context of this framework newer players relatively new companies especially they would find this framework very very useful as part of the international business plan preparation especially medium scale companies or small scale companies they need this kind of framework to prepare their international business plan even ranbaxi if i look if you read my book on international business there is a case study of ranbaxi and in that case study i have discussed about how ranbaxi prepared their business plan originally focusing on international business ranbaxi had to prepare a very strong international business plan in the beginning itself to succeed globally and ranbaxi did it and they succeeded it so likewise when ranbaxi was a small company so likewise if you have a small company it is possible if you have vision and mission and if you use this pre framework i'm sure companies can uh prepare their business plan uh and 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 then they can succeed they need to prepare business plan scientifically and in a structured way and they can succeed they need this kind of business plan if you are already a multinational company you don't need this framework okay Okay, so one uh, last question, probably. Uh, do you think that this uh, COVID nineteen has any impact on this framework, or pro- particularly any kind of an unprecedented situation like this kind of a pandemic, would have a, a, any bearing upon this um, uh, framework? Definitely, because I would say that the importance of this framework is much more in the context of COVID nineteen, because uh, problems. is one of the important key constraints in this framework and problems like people not people were not talking about problems you know uh beforehand like before covid 19 everybody was happy everybody was happily doing their business everybody was happily doing their life and everything was okay you know people were generally happy in business businessmen were okay they never worried about it entrepreneurs had good time entrepreneurs had heavenly time but now all the entrepreneurs are demotivated because of covid-19 problems entrepreneurship is in doldrums for next one or two years so 
So you have to anticipate this kind of crisis or recessions or problems, not only COVID-19 crisis, but also different kind of other problems. I talked about it. And, and those are expected anticipated problems, plus unanticipated, unexpected problems like COVID-19. So all these need to be expected and taken into account. What you will do, what, what we can do in case if you face this kind of problems, expected and unexpected problems. Expected problem, three types of problems I talked about. Unexpected problem, for example, COVID-19 is an unexpected problem. Mm -hmm. So if such problems occur, how do we survive? How do we cope up? How do we catch up our business? So that needs to be foreseen in our business plan. So I would say that this is very, very, very important now in the COVID-19 context. Sir, one question has just come that can cognitive bias have a positive impact on the brand image of a company? Cognitive bias is a problem if you are a small or medium scale company. You are already a very, very well known established company. Sometimes you will not face serious cognitive bias. For example, Amida Bachchan may not face cognitive bias if he goes to Sydney or America. So Sachin Tendulkar may not face uh, cognitive bias in India, but he might face cognitive bias in America. So because nobody knows Sachin Tendulkar in America. So, so if, if, and your brand is very well known, your brand will not face cognitive bias. For example, Infosys doesn't face cognitive bias in America. But if you have a, I know about a small company called InfoBeans from Indore. InfoBeans is a small Indian IT company from Madhya Pradesh. InfoBeans might face cognitive bias in America, but InfoSys will not face cognitive bias in America. That is the difference of brand equity. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, one question was there, but that you've already answered the, the application of this uh, framework in a company that you've already answered. So uh, we'll just be uh, closing the session for today. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you for being with us. Bye-bye, everybody. And please take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.